The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Advances in the Management of Moderate to Severe Atopic Dermatitis. How can we address unmet medical needs in individual patients to optimize long-term outcomes? Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash JYX860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Leo from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center in Chicago, Illinois. Welcome to this educational activity on addressing unmet needs in patients with atopic dermatitis with the goal of improving long-term outcomes. Atopic dermatitis is complex, multifactorial, and has historically had limited therapeutic options, but the landscape of this disease is now changing rapidly. Pathways contributing to the pathogenesis of this disease are continually being discovered, and new therapies are being developed at an unprecedented rate. Among the most promising of the new treatments are crisoboral and dupilumab. Crisoboral is a non-steroidal topical phosphodiesterase 4, or PD-4, inhibitor approved in the United States in 2016 for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis in patients two years of age and older. Dupilumab is the first and only biologic treatment for patients age 12 and older with uncontrolled moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. It is administered subcutaneously and targets IL-4 and IL-13 receptor signaling, an important source of type 2 inflammation. We as clinicians are usually able to adequately manage most of our patients with atopic dermatitis using long-standing and familiar pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions. However, Many individuals have atopic dermatitis that profoundly affects their quality of life and yet remain inadequately treated. Considering both patient perspectives and physician experiences, today's program is going to take a closer look at the challenges associated with the management of patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. At the end of the activity, I hope you're able to look at these challenges more as opportunities and are able to integrate recent therapeutic advances into treatment approaches that emphasize the need for individualized care and patient engagement and collaboration to optimize outcomes. When we come back, I'll be joined by Dr. Robert Sidbury, who will lend his expertise to a discussion of current strategies to optimize the care of patients with atopic dermatitis. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining me today is Dr. Robert Sidbury, a pediatric dermatologist from Seattle Children's Hospital and University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, Washington. Please welcome Dr. Sidbury. Wow. So glad to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. So let's dive right in. I really want to explore with you what kind of an impact atopic dermatitis can have on the patients and their caregivers, because we know this is a serious issue. It's often discussed as not just being a disease of the patient, but the whole family unit. Absolutely. I think that's an important message for providers, because the last thing we want is these kids to feel like they're on their own battling with their disease affecting what foods they eat, uh, what activities they do. And so if providers, when they make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, make it as a family diagnosis, I think that's going to work better for everybody. I think that's such a great point. Now, when we think about some of the impacts, we see impacts at home, but also at school for kids. What have you experienced with some of your patients? How severe an impact can it have on school life? Well, a tremendous impact. As you know, kids with moderate to severe eczema lose up to two hours of sleep a night. Their parents, a commensurate amount, 1.9 hours of sleep a night. That's going to have effects on the kids' school performance, their attention, their interactions with uh, their peers. It's going to have effect on the family dynamic. So it really works its way through the whole family. I think that's such a critical piece. And I often feel that when families are when they're hesitant to treat the disease, I'll often say that, gosh, if we don't treat it, there is a potential risk for not treating. And this is the kind of issues we're talking about that we're gonna have impact on sleep and school and work for our adult patients. PVI developed this survey and they interviewed about 100 adults with atopic dermatitis, moderate and severe. Mostly they were in the moderate group, about 85%. And interestingly, it was mostly women, about 85% women. And they asked a number of questions. The first thing is they found that 
many of them had other conditions that were associated with atopic dermatitis like we would expect. So uh, about 37% had asthma, but many patients had allergic rhinitis, more than a third, obesity in about 29%, uh, food allergy in more than a quarter. So some of those comorbidities that we often see with atopic dermatitis were quite present in these patients. And then they really tried to explore what they felt their overall health was. Many of them selected good, so they kind of had from uh, poor all the way up to excellent on this scale. About 40% selected good, but a, a fairly large group selected fair or poor overall health. So I think we really see that this can have an important impact on the quality of life. And when this is sort of broken down, some of the surveys will look between both patient and provider when, when we try to estimate the kind of quality of life implications or ramifications. Uh, on the order of 8% will have an extreme effect on quality of life by both patient and provider, and many, many, more than half, will have at least a moderate effect on quality of life. Do you find that to be the case for your patients as well? I do, certainly, and one of the things, my two least favorite words to pair together are just eczema, because I hear it all the time, and when you see statistics like this about the impact it has on kids and their families, it's anything but just eczema for those patients on the moderate to severe end of the spectrum. And part of that is fed into by the fact that most of them are in good health. Fantastic, that's great. Some of them are in, in less well health as you've described, but those patients who are in good medical health are still having tremendous impacts on their quality of life that need to be considered when we think about what therapies to entertain. It's so true, and, and you really feel that anybody who diminishes the severity of the disease in total, they just don't have a lot of experience. We'll say, oh, it's just a little rash. What do you have to worry about? Use a little bit of cortisone cream and you'll be fine. It's like, well, you've not seen the people that really suffer. Uh, another really interesting part of the survey looked at some of the psychological comorbidities. So things like the emotional aspects, in particular depression and anxiety, a fair number of patients will rate this as at least somewhat significant. Uh, and that's powerful too, to think that, that this disease is affecting their state of mind, which we know is part of that vicious cycle because when you're feeling stressed or anxious about your condition, we know that that stress and anxiety actually fuels the disease as well, so you get stuck in that vicious cycle. One of the hardest parts, I think, is that interpersonal relationship aspect. So for kids, of course, their peers at school, sometimes they'll be shunned. For adults, it can be intimate relationships, but also friends, friendships and family members. And in the survey, they again found somewhat significant uh, reports of this being an issue for those patients. So really powerful, not just limited to the skin, not just limited to the patient. This is an interpersonal family structure and really even going beyond that affecting all of us. Um, I would love to quickly review some of the current knowledge about the pathophysiology because now we know this is a serious disease, it has big impact, but what's going on here? Yeah, so when I look at a, a cartoon model of inflammation and atopic dermatitis, you see all of these different players, T cells, JAK, STAT, IL-4, all of these things that just make parents crazy because they're like, that makes no sense to me. It makes me crazy too. It makes me crazy too. <laughs> and what I'll say is the previous treatments would basically suppress all of that. Well, that is there for a reason. It helps keep us healthy. It keeps us from getting infections. Part of inflammation is critical to our good health. So when we have new treatments that can target and just pick up a couple of the key players in atopic dermatitis specifically, that's when we get the good without the bad, or less of the bad, certainly, because any medication can have adverse effects. That's a great point. Um, and I think that when we're more targeted, we can see this better risk benefit. My, my dream is that we will get to what people talk about as precision medicine, where we have such a good understanding of both the patient and their physiology and the medicines, we'll be able to match patients to proper treatment, both for the therapy effect, but also to diminish the side effects. So speaking of that, what are some of the challenges with diagnosing this condition? We've been talking about it as if it's just something we know right away, mm -hmm. and maybe it is, but is there a trouble time, you know, figuring out what it is? Are there situations where you feel like you need to do some testing? How do you go about it? Yeah, it's a great question, Peter, because it is one that we tend to just sort of form an instant impression and a gestalt and say, like, oh, it's atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. But I think you and I have been doing this a long time and we come across patients who are like, gosh, I'm just not sure and then where do you go? And I think for providers who don't see as much atopic dermatitis, there are certain critical things to fall back on. And first and foremost, the question, does it itch? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't itch, think really long and hard about whether or not it's atopic dermatitis. And then thereafter, is there a family history, not only of atopic dermatitis, but of these other comorbidities you mentioned, food allergies, asthma, 
rhinitis? Uh, and then is it in the proper distribution? Those are the sort of main cri diagnostic criteria of atopic dermatitis when the diagnosis is in question. And does the family history, does that help you if they say there's a strong family history or none? How important is that? It, it does put patients at risk. So there are um, families where there is just every single member has something like either eczema or asthma, hay fever. And then for sure, I feel like their children are going to be at greater risk for developing atopic dermatitis. Mm. And sometimes that's a really important piece of information to know to maybe start moisturizing that child very, very early as soon as they're born. On the other hand, we also see patients, um, depending on the studies, up to one out of five patients who have clearly atopic dermatitis, but don't have those same family histories that we just talked about. So either way it can, but it can be a risk factor that makes us really think harder about it. And what about having the concomitant allergies, these comorbid situations like hay fever or allergic conjunctivitis as well? Do you need that to be able to call it atopic dermatitis or can there be patients that seem to just have the eczematous skin eruption without the other true atopic features? The latter for sure. So um, some patients we will refer often refer to the atopic march where patients get food allergies and eczema as a baby, asthma as a child, allergic rhinitis as an adult, and they march orderly through all of those throughout their lifetime. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty, as you allude, who just have one or the other, including just eczema. You mentioned the morphology. They have to have that eczematous rash. And again, we know it because we see it all the time. It's like a family friend. You recognize them across the room in a crowded train station. But it does change for different patients at different points of life and even at different points of their disease, those acute lesions versus more chronic ones. When you think about different types of patients, what sorts of patterns do you see and what kinds of things will help you really recognize it when you first look at it? Yeah, it's a great question. And atopic dermatitis evolves over the life course, right? So the, as well as just eczema, I don't like, I also don't like patients and parents being told, oh, they'll grow out of it right? Mm -hmm. So we've already talked about adults having atopic dermatitis. I guarantee you every single one of them was told that they would grow out of it. They didn't. So that's not fair. So the way that I use that language is I'll say that atopic dermatitis evolves. As a baby, oftentimes the distribution is more extensor, more facial, mm -hmm. more truncal. Classically with an adult or an older child, it's in the flexures of the elbows or the knees. The older they get, the more aggressive and effective they are at scratching. It can become very lichenified. So you get those very thick plaques uh, that can have implications for treatment. So there's a whole uh, different array of presentations that can change over the lifespan of a single individual patient. It makes it a little tricky sometimes to be able to find that. And that really is interesting because we know in lighter skin patients versus darker skin patients, it can look a little bit different. And one of the challenges I've heard people talk about a lot is in a darker skin patient, it's tougher to see the redness. What do you use for clues there? How do you help help those patients get the treatment they need so that we're not missing that? Yeah, for sure, and skin type matters tremendously, both in diagnosis, as you allude, but also treatment. Oftentimes, patients with darker skin types, when the eczema is improving and healing, it can leave behind some dispigmentation, meaning the skin tone either looks a little lighter or darker than normal. And if the parents and the patients aren't aware that that's healing skin and not active eczema necessarily, they might treat inappropriately for that healing skin. But the presentations that I'll talk about in terms of different um, ways to address the, the, the fact that uh, skin type can obscure the diagnosis, well, fall back on those diagnostic criteria. Does it itch? Mm. Is it in the right distribution? That said, sometimes patients with darker skin types have different morphologies. We've all seen that follicular type of eczema where it almost looks like a perma goosebump type of presentation, which is very itchy and very eczematous. And this reminds me, you talked about knowing when the disease is flaring up, and I actually learned the pearl from you. You have your little touch test. I wonder if you could tell us about the touch test. Thank you, because it alludes to um, that idea that a patient has active eczema. It's red, it's itchy. They're prescribed, let's say, a topical medication to make it better. It does. The redness and the itch are gone, but it's discolored. Well, that looks abnormal. It does not look like normal skin yet. And so unless the patient and the parent are properly educated, they're like, well, still looks abnormal, let's keep treating it. I will tell them that if they look away and they just feel, if they can't feel it and it's not red and itchy, just moisturize it, don't treat it with medicines. That's a great pearl. That has served me well for many years since I learned that from you. Thank you for that one. Now, when we think about other things in the differential, so those cases maybe that don't quite seem right, maybe it's just 
practically, functionally, they're not getting better, you're worried about something else going on, what else do you look for? What are the things you're going to do in terms of tests or in terms of thinking about it? Are there anything that stands out in your mind? And so there are a few things you can rely on and a few things you can't. What you can is a biomarker. There's not a blood test that can say this is eczema or it isn't. And that's something that is, makes it challenging because that's an easy test to order, um, but it doesn't exist. A skin biopsy. There are very specific findings for atopic dermatitis. The problem is they're not specific enough because allergic contact dermatitis or seborrheic dermatitis, mimics of, allergic, of atopic dermatitis, are identical, identical histologically, as you know. And when there is a test like a scraping for scabies or fungus, great, do that but there's not a specific one for ectopic dermatitis. Well, that's important, and I think one other piece I would say is if we're not sure, sometimes a second opinion can be helpful to get another take on it because there are a number of things. So my weak weakness or weak point would be some of the metabolic or genetic conditions. So the little babies that I'm concerned might have something else going on, I wouldn't, I'm gonna reach out for a support call. If you've got an infant or a young child who has bad eczema, but they're also having opportunistic infections or recurrent sinusitis or pneumonia and they're failing to thrive. That atopic dermatitis may be a marker for an underlying primary immunodeficiency. So that's when we all need to reach out uh, for more help, not to miss something as critical as that. For adults, I'll defer to you, though I know for one particular condition that can be a very easy mimic is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And that can look very much like atopic dermatitis and that's where things like biopsies are critical. I totally agree, yeah, and the other thing I would say in adults is because they're more frequently on polypharmacy, a whole bunch of medicines, I like to look and see could there be a, a drug reaction happening here that's mimicking as well. Um, and then of course we want to think about connective tissue disorders, mm -hmm. particularly subacute cutaneous lupus can look both like psoriasis or it can kind of look eczematous. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to keep our eyes peeled for those. Although I feel lucky that these are generally rare, you know, usually when we, we see it, we know it and we're okay, there's usually not a lot of discussion around this except when they're not responding the way we hope they respond. Right. Now, when we get to the disease, we're going to get really into treating the disease in a little bit, but some of those comor comorbidities that we see happening with it, so this atopic march we talked about, how do you manage these other things? So the asthma, the rhinitis, the food allergy, are you directly managing that or do you feel like this requires a team approach? When you talk to patients and counsel them, what are you telling them about these things? Well, it's been sort of an exploding list of associations. I'm not sure if they've all earned the right to be called comorbidities yet with atopic dermatitis because we're learning more and more about them. But it seems like every month a new association with atopic dermatitis comes down the road. Some very well established, we've talked about those atopic March conditions. I tend to co-manage those, certainly with the pediatrician. I, I just see kids, so the pediatrician's the quarterback um, mm -hmm. or the family care doc or the nurse practitioner or the the, the physician's assistant, who's ever primarily taking care of that child as their primary care physician, is the quarterback. Um, we are the specialists. We add value to their skin care. Sometimes allergists are relevant as well. Pulmonologists, if asthma is a part of the picture. So each patient sort of defines their care team, but I think it's really important to have that structure. And the more we learn about things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, for many years, we would have a ready explanation for a tired, fidgety child. They're losing sleep. They have bad eczema, of course. Well, now we're learning that that's actually one of the comorbidities that really has sort of seemed to, to separate itself from the pack and say that patients with atopic dermatitis really truly do seem to be more at risk for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You treat that differently. So it's really critical for primary care docs to keep that in the back of their mind, dermatologists, all of us to keep that in the back of our mind so we don't uh, sort of misdirect therapy. There are some complications that are not comorbidities, but I think they're things that come with the territory for these patients. And in particular, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the role of Staphylococcus aureus bacteria. What do you think <laughs> about this? No, it's a huge role and a role that we're learning more and more about each day. The challenge is even as simple as defining whether a child has a staph infection. 90% of patients in some patient populations with atopic dermatitis carry staph aureus on their skin. So a culture is going to tell you nothing. So it's challenging in that regard because not only is there active infection sometimes that you must treat, but it seems I'll oftentimes liken the staph aureus on the skin of patients with atopic dermatitis to gasoline on the fire of the eczema. Mm. Even when there's not a frank infection, it drives along the process so that treatments for the staph, like for instance, dilute bleach baths, 
We found that they prevent infections, great. That was the goal of the study that showed us they helped. But they also seem to improve the severity of patients' eczema everywhere but above the neck where they weren't in the water. It's been such an exciting time for that because I think we're learning more that the staph is a primary driver. There have been a couple papers even showing that it produces a toxin that actually can in incite the immune system and damage the skin barrier. What about viruses? Are they playing a role and when do you worry about that? Yeah, herpes simplex uh, virus is a huge one um, because when most uh, patients with out atopic dermatitis get herpes simplex virus, the classic is a cold sore, right? A solitary, painful lesion no one likes, but generally self-limited goes away. Because of the unique nature of the immune system, the cutaneous immune system in atopic dermatitis, you can get so-called eczema herpeticum, which can be very dangerous and needs to be treated. And then, of course, there's the eczema coxsackium, where the coxsackie virus of hand, foot, and mouth, normally pretty benign and self-limited, can do something similar, like a more severe version of that in those patients. And then the eczema vaccinatum, which is why these guys are not supposed to be getting the smallpox vaccine, because that can then do the same kind of thing. So it's kind of those three guys putting together with this impaired barrier function and probably you know dysregulation mm -hmm. of the immune system that allows them to be at risk and then last but not least our fungus among us friends what about them is there any role for yeasts or fungus in these guys do we feel that is playing a role yeah for sure um, it's a common condition for everyone right uh, tinea fungus um, what I will say to uh, our residents and our students, a kind of good sort of pearl I learned in dermatology school very early on is if it's red and scaly, scrape it. And that's how you find out if there's fungus there. So if there's any question of the diagnosis, that's where you do have a very ready exam to do at the bedside that can rule that out. Let's get into treatment now, especially in our patients who in some ways suffer the most, the moderate and severe patients, because they, I think, really have a rough road ahead. The milder disease, sometimes it can be, as much as we hate the term, just eczema. You put a little cream on, they're okay, they don't need much. But as you get more severe, this is not that simple, and I think we need a little bit more help and support, and I think a longitudinal plan of attack, not just one thing. So can you talk us through a little bit about some of the goals of therapy and some of your general approaches? We can kind of get into that. Right, so those kids with it's just eczema, moisturizers go away. We rarely see those kids, but I think it's a great place to start the discussion because what's foundational for them? Moisturizing their skin, avoiding triggers. That's foundational for every patient throughout the spectrum of disease, mild, moderate, severe. So whatever more uh, aggressive treatment we talk about, whether it's topical therapies or systemic therapies, those patients should always be moisturizing their skin, avoiding triggers. Uh, so that's critical always. But then you do, I think I love the way you put it, you sort of get into a stepwise, uh, big picture therapy plan for a patient where they realize that the therapies are going to treat acute flares. The fourth major diagnostic criteria of eczema is that it waxes and wanes. They're good days and bad. So I will liken this to uh, eczema sort of perking along down here, moisturize, avoid triggers. It's all of a sudden very aggressive and active and impactful. That's when you need more aggressive treatments and then your goal is to get them back to mostly maintenance therapy with moisturizers. Sometimes that's easier said than done. Now, when you do this, how do you balance out the risks of some of the treatments with the risk of flaring up the eczema and letting it run crazy? Right, so first line is still topical corticosteroids. Uh, when we've gotten to that point. So we need to just make sure that patients and parents are properly educated. Then we may to need to make them realize what those risks are. And primarily, if you're using appropriate strength steroids in appropriate locations, the major risk is thinning of the skin. So empowering the parents with their own information about a potential side effect before it's a bell they can't unring is critical. And that's gonna help them adhere to your treatment plan rather than being afraid of it there are so many points where I've seen this fall apart. You know, sometimes you're right, it's just this, this vague fear about them but not knowing. So giving a name to it, explaining what's really going on, I think that shines light in the darkness. Now, what do you do if that's not enough? If they come back to you and say, gosh, I, I used the steroid that you told me and it really wasn't enough. And I, got, I think there are kind of two ways that I think about it. One is a primary treatment failure where they said I just didn't get much better at all. Or more commonly, I got better. But as soon as I stopped, I flared up mm -hmm. again. And you told me not to use it all the time, Dr. Sugar. You said don't put it on every day. So I tried to follow that, but then I was miserable for the rest of the month. Mm -hmm. What do you do next? Second line therapy now is topical calcineurin inhibitors, things like tacrolimus, 
pemacrolimus. Both have been around now for nearly 20 years. Um, both are non-steroidal. Both, when they came out, were the first non-steroidals that actually worked, mm. uh, and therefore they were prescribed quite uh, aggressively, even in infants, and they've never been approved for babies under two. And so a warning was issued in 2005 called a black box warning saying, don't use these in babies. Don't use them first line. Don't use them continuously. And we use them very safely within those parameters. But that black box warning uh, is oftentimes a, a tough uh, mountain to climb in parents who are already alarmed by some of the treatments you're recommending. Do we have any alternatives if the family is nervous about that black box warning, which mentions the C word, cancer, <laughs> on there, which can freak some families out? What, uh, what have you used in its place? We do, and that we did not until the last couple of years, and that's kind of harking back to the new molecules and new targets that we talked about earlier. We referenced a medicine called crisoberol, is also not approved for kids under two, um, and is generally indicated for mild to moderate disease. Um, and has been a nice adjunctive therapy for patients where we're taught, those type of patients we're talking about, where the topical steroids are either not embraced or not working, or not working sustainably enough, and the topical calcineurin inhibitors also aren't an appropriate fit. So you could build the patient a plan where they're using their moisturization, their trigger avoidance. When they flare, they could potentially use a non-steroidal, but if it's a, a bad enough flare, they could use their topical corticosteroid for a few days, a week, maybe even two weeks, cool things back down, get them back under control, and if we feel like they're at risk for spiking up again, they could go back to one of their non-steroidals, the tacrolimus, pimicrolimus, or crisoboral, to kind of maintain that in a safe way. I really like that. Uh, and that brings us to our next point, what happens next? What if that's not enough? Are there any tricks before we get to the systemic agents? What are their little tips and tricks we we'll use for these more severe patients, um, such as, for example, as wet wrap therapy? How do you approach those? Wet wraps are the idea that you apply either a medicine or a moisturizer, then a few layers of a moist gauze or some sort of wrap. Uh, some people use wet pajamas, that's as pleasant as it sounds, uh, to kind of drive in that moisture and then a dry layer over that. Um, yes, I will use them. Uh, as it sounds, they're not always super well in, embraced by kids, especially overnight therapy. I find almost too challenging to use very mm. often. But when I use them on localized areas, they can be incredibly effective. A wet wrap for maybe 40, 45 minutes, uh, take it off, moisturize immediately afterwards so nothing ever dries out. Let the child have that time be something they can do some screen time or something that's otherwise restricted. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a carrot for the stick. Uh, so they get something out of it because just telling them their skin's going to get better might not be incentivizing enough for that child. So I think those are all things that are, are useful adjuncts. They'll be on their screen time saying, five more minutes. I like these wet wraps. <laughs> I love these wet wraps. Going, I love these know? wet wraps. <laughs> exactly. Those are great pearls, and I think those are so important for families who are feeling stuck and maybe don't want to go to the next level, but maybe that takes us to our next level. And one thing I wanted to sort of explore with you before we get into the bigger guns is antihistamines. Mm -hmm. A lot of families are complaining about the itch. The itch seems to be one of the key driving irritants for this whole process and keeps people up at night. So many times we'll jump to an oral antihistamine with the good intentions that this should control the itch. What's the truth on antihistamines for atopic derm? What we've learned is that antihistamines histamines for the itch of eczema are not terribly effective. If there's concurrent rhinitis or some sort of comorbidity like we've talked about, terrific. And that concurrent rhinitis can drive the eczema. So there's a pathway for use of antihistamines. If they're losing so much sleep at night because they're itching so badly, a sedating antihistamine at bedtime cannot just knock the child out. It can interrupt that itch scratch cycle mm -hmm. because many kids will go to sleep looking pretty good and wake up a bloody scratched mess. Mm -hmm. And if you can use a sedating antihistamine to interrupt that cycle, there is value there. And then as we move up to the next level, right before we get to the systemic drugs, we have one other little stop, uh, the power of light. How do you think about phototherapy? So phototherapy can be very effective, especially at sort of preventing flares and sort of keeping a, a patient from getting worse rather than someone who's incredibly inflamed and doing very poorly, then starting light often isn't as effective. The challenges of light go beyond our concerns with potential skin cancer and the risks we always talk about with light. Light therapy typically is two to three times a week 
for not just a week, not just a two, two weeks, sometimes months at a time. That's time consuming, it's expensive, it's not necessarily accessible. Some insurance companies don't pay for it. Sometimes the closest light provider is 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. So these things are a real challenge. So when it's available, when it's accessible, it can be a lovely bridge off of systemic therapy back to topical therapy or a lovely prevention of flares, but it's not always the right answer. And safety of light in children, how do you feel about the narrowband UVB, the one we typically use for safety in kids, maybe say six years to 12 years? Are you pretty comfortable with it there? Yeah, I am. We have a careful discussion, of course, because uh, narrowband UVB is UVB and UVB can potentially have carcinogenic effects. But these have been studied pretty well now, even in kids for a fairly extended period of time. And we're becoming more and more comfortable with the safety of modest uh, incremental doses of narrowband UVB to treat atopic dermatitis. Um, the other modalities of light, UVA1, PUVA, those we use less in children. As an adult provider, you may use them more. Honestly, not much more. I still prefer narrowband UVB. And so that brings us to our systemic options. So talk to me about that. Now they've, they've tried all their topicals, they're maximized. Where do we go next? Yeah, so that's where up until the last couple of years, we've had a narrow set of inadequate options. Mm. It's probably the best way I can put it. One that is uh, illustrative is prednisone, systemic steroids. Until 2017, there was one systemic medication, FDA approved, uh, a little bit different in Europe, but FDA approved in the United States to treat atopic dermatitis, and that was prednisone. If you take a room full of dermatologists and you ask them to raise their hand for their least favorite systemic medication, for atopic dermatitis, it would be prednisone. And I just want to play the devil's advocate because there are some providers who really like prednisone, mm -hmm. be it by mouth, be it intramuscular, mm -hmm. you know, a little shot, seems to work really well. Why don't we like it in this condition? Why is it bad? So it's seductively effective, mm -hmm. right? So this patient comes into you, they're losing sleep, parents are exhausted, and I can give them prednisone by any route, and two days later, they look like a million bucks. They are not itching, their rash is gone right away. Who wouldn't want that? Well, two days after they're done, after their prednisone course ends, they're oftentimes worse. And so it's a short-term fix to a long-term problem and it oftentimes gives a couple weeks of respite, depending on how long you use it, uh, followed by you're right back where you were, sometimes worse. Mm. And you cannot keep giving more and more prednisone. You're gonna weaken the bones, you're going to uh, lead to infection. There's a whole list of potential side effects of ongoing prednisone that we all know too well. Well, that sums it up for that. With the new systemic medicine then, that kind of enters into the scene and has changed stuff for us, while I always say we, we were like little puppy dogs watching this revolution of biologics mm -hmm. happen for psoriasis, now we're, they're all tripping over each other, there's so many options. Uh, you know, things like ulcerative colitis and, mm -hmm. and Crohn's disease, they have many options. Rheumatoid arthritis has dozens, it seems like. Finally, we have one for atopic derm. Can you tell us about that one? Yeah, it's been super exciting, as you say, because there's been, it's just eczema's sort of been left behind, and um, that's because the science wasn't there, right? So the science has caught up, so the medications have caught up. And so the first one that has uh, been approved, it was approved in 2017, is dupilumab. It is a spe specific uh, uh, subcutaneous medication that's in, uh, administered every other week uh, that targets IL-4 and IL-13. And those are specific chemical players in the inflammatory cascade of atopic dermatitis. And it's been super exciting to have both participated in the clinical trials for adolescents and now kids six to 11. Uh, I have, uh, we were one of the sites for those kids uh, looking to go down to six months of age to six years of age to, to study this medication. But this is a medication that was approved in March of 2017 for adults, has gotten FDA approval down to 12 years of age, which is super exciting. It's a big game changer, I feel like, for these patients who have truly tried a lot of the things leading up to it, and, and that's what's so exciting. We finally have something to rescue them who've been stuck. Tell me about the side effects of this medicine. What are we worried about? It's a powerful systemic medicine. It seems to work very, very well. Does it have any catches, any side issues? Yeah, probably the one that's not surprising at all is injection site reactions. Anything can have injection site reactions, and this was neither no more no, nor less than what we've learned from psoriasis injectable medications. Um, the one that sort of jumps out that's uh, a little bit unique is about 
10% of patients in the adult trials uh, developed a conjunctivitis, uh, ocular inflammation. In the studies, patients didn't generally have to drop out of the trial. They were able to treat through it. But I think this has been sort of a clarion call to dermatologists to say, hey, we need to pay a little bit more attention to the ocular comorbidities of atopic dermatitis on the front end. Mm -hmm. And then now we've got this medication there, it's calling our attention to it, so we know better how to deal with it and distinguish what's the eczema and what's the medication, and sometimes that's hard. It's interesting too, because we know some of the side effects are different in different groups. So the, it's also approved for asthma, but in that group, they didn't see the conjunctivitis. Right. So, so we've put together this concept of kind of a step therapy. The key piece, I think, is getting that all that information to the family and coming up with that plan together. How do you approach that? I think sometimes it's multiple visits, number one. So you sometimes cannot get all of this into one visit. Um, Follow-up visits are a great time to sort of see how uh, treatment plans are playing out and seeing where you need to go from there. So certainly if you were getting to the point where you were talking about some of these more systemic agents, that would more often be a patient you've known for at least a visit or two and seeing how things have done. I think eczema action plans are really helpful. Uh, we in the dermatologic community have sort of uh, co-opted those from the asthma world. Asthma action plans have been a thing for years. Eczema action plans have not. Eczema care, you just in uh, one minute went through the nature of this complicated treatment algorithm and asked the question, how do we communicate that? Well, it's really hard. It's hard enough to disabuse parents of myths about bathing's bad or bathing's good when really it's bathing and moisturizing properly, which is necessary, not an absolute frequency of bathing. So there's fundamental things that you need to cover in terms of the education of this condition. And if you can put it forth in an eczema action plan that has, you do this when your skin does this, you do that when your skin does that, in a written dynamic plan, I think that's huge. I think leveraging advocacy support groups like the National Eczema Association, where there's wonderful educational information that the parents can in their own time sort of digest and go through and then come back to clinics with good questions about wet wraps and bleach baths. I think sort of leveraging those sorts of things to expand the educational scope of that not hour long visit is a really good idea. Well, speaking of which, how quickly will you see someone back? Because sometimes patients will tell me, you know, they sort of gave me 11 refills and said, see you next year. Um, that's probably too long. Mm -hmm. what, what's a good time frame to see people back in general for you? There's a large uh, divergence of opinion and styles with that, I think. So my approach, um, I don't like to see patients back, for instance, in two weeks. Why not? Because oftentimes any change in therapy leads to a brief holiday of improvement, and then there's sort of uh, a fall back to the mean or a fall back to where you are. That's where I want to know where they are, is where they've fallen back to, what that rhythm is that you describe. I love that analogy. Um, so I don't want to see them back too quickly because I want to know where they are, how much medicine they're needing to stay or to use to stay in a, a safe, sustainable place. So I love to go about a month uh, would be a, a standard amount of time for me uh, and then uh, take it from there depending on how they're doing. I think that's great. And I think the other piece is, is offering the ability to contact you, be it through a portal, through a messaging system, or, or through a phone call if there's a problem. Because I often will say if you're not improving in, in just three to five days or a week, if things are going worse or we think something, something is not, not right, I want to know about it right away. And it's hard. It is hard, but I feel like that's the secret sauce, if you will. It's nothing magic. It's not any secret treatments in a drawer hidden in a safe or something. It's just that connection with the patient. And that really is a nice segue into our last piece I want to talk to you about, and it's about how do patients feel about the care that they get from a variety of providers. And there's been some interesting surveys out lately, and of course part of it through the National Eczema Association, they've done some of their work both formally and informally. They mm -hmm. hear all sorts of good and bad things from patients about their experiences. And when we look at this, we see that a fair number of patients are, are really not as satisfied as they could be. What do you think about this when you, when you look at this in aggregate? Yeah, it's disheartening because this is what we do, right? We want everybody to be extremely satisfied with um, their care because that means they're satisfied with their body and their disease. And yet, though disheartening, it's not at all surprising. 
um, because we've talked about the fact that the treatments have just not been either sufficiently effective or sufficiently sustainable or sufficiently messaged in terms of patients' acceptability to them, mentioning things like steroid phobia, to expect to see a better rating score than that. So while um, I'm not surprised, I do think it gives all of us, especially now that we have more tools in our toolbox, a tremendous opportunity to do better. When we look at this, this slide in particular, for example, they're showing the satisfaction with the current therapies. And I, I'd like to think that in a few years, we see that the vast majority are only somewhat satisfied and 21% not satisfied at all. To think about hopefully in five years, maybe that quickly, this will shift and we'll see this curve move all the way up where people are extremely satisfied for the most part, uh, instead of just a little bit satisfied. And I'm hoping we'll get more and more targeted treatments that'll be safe and effective for these patients that can change everything. Uh, the other piece I think is this coming together as a team. If we can get all of the allied health professionals working together, our pharmacist friends, the nurses, our physician assistants, uh, everybody together so that we can really send a unified message, that's going to help all of us. Rob, thank you. This has been such a great discussion, such an exciting time to be in the middle of treating atopic dermatitis with new therapies on the horizon, new understanding, just about to bubble up. So we're, we're in the middle of this exciting, exciting experience of this disease. And when we come back, Dr. Sidbury and I will be joined by a patient from my practice, and we're going to further explore some of the real-world considerations in managing patients with atopic dermatitis. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Building on our previous discussion, Dr. Sidbury and I will now be joined by a patient from my practice, and we will take a closer look at some of the practical considerations when it comes to personalizing the care of patients with atopic dermatitis. Please welcome Ms. Katie Keel. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to talk to you a little bit about what it's been like having atopic dermatitis from the patient's perspective. We've been chatting for a long time about how it is being a provider, but that's really only half the story. So maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've had eczema for my whole life, and um, it was very severe as a child um, and an infant. And um, I think it sort of tailed off to be a little bit more mild during high school, but still really dealt with like dry skin and then um, severe flare-ups like in my early 20s, my mid-20s, I guess most of my 20s, and then again um, during my pregnancy with my second child. So um, severe for most of my life and now I think I'm most stable that I've ever been thanks to you, really. So that's kind of a general overview. That's, that's a lot. That's a lifetime of, of serious issues going on, and I'm so glad to hear that things are doing better lately. Yeah. Tell us about some of the different treatment options you had tried, you know, leading up to where we are now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've always been on some kind of topical steroid. As a child, it was a compound of uh, salicylic acid and topical steroid and Vaseline. Then it was just plain old topical steroids, and then with a severe flare-up, I had light therapy, which really helped a lot. And then I pursued getting my own light box. So now I have my own light box at home, which um, helps in maintenance. I've also been on methotrexate, and I've been on Dupixent most recently, although methotrexate was probably about 10 years ago. So, so you've yeah. really seen the whole gamut from the yeah. basic things all the way up to the most modern. Yeah, absolutely. And also like hypnotherapy and acupuncture and some other more holistic approaches. I think that's awesome because that really really shows, I think, a good cross-section of what our patients go through. They try yeah. many different traditions. They try all sorts of different approaches. What are some of the pluses and minuses to the topical therapies you use, like the cortisones and stuff? Yeah, well, I think for me, because I've always been on them, they were never, like, scary to me. Um, and uh, I think that they were also very ineffective for a long time mm. um, because, and I think that the component that really changed, was the game changer for me was when you added that topical antibacterial, um, which made the difference in really slowing things down because I felt like for a while I would just keep putting on the topical steroid and nothing would really change. 
Um, another thing that was helpful was the bleach baths. Mm. So, um, we had yeah. talked about the bleach baths a little bit earlier, and yeah. I think it's so interesting to think about this role of bacteria mm -hmm. in the disease. So that's that's fascinating that the, both of those pieces maybe focus on the microbiome or the healthy skin bacteria. Yeah. And it's also interesting that you weren't afraid of the topical steroids, which is kind of nice. And that, mm -hmm. in a way, it's validating because I think it suggests that you were using it. I, and I know, yeah. you know, having taken care of you, I know you were very diligent about using it. Yes. But I think it still didn't give you relief. So sometimes no. people will be dismissed and say, oh, it didn't work because you didn't use it. But, I, you know, here we are. You, yeah. you know you did. You yeah. weren't afraid of using it. Oh, but yeah. you needed something more. Yes, absolutely. Um, I used to get a one-pound uh, tub of... Um, Triamcinolone. Triamcinolone. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And then my dermatologist would say, see you next year. Here's your, here's your tub, which I would refill because I would go through it and um, nothing would really change. And so I think with my flare up that I had when I was pregnant with my son, my mom was the one that really was like, you need to go see your doctor. And I said, it doesn't matter if I go see my doctor, nothing's going to change. And so then she went on Google and she found you because we, we were really trying to find like the combination of a holistic approach as well as like a medical doctor. And so that was the game changer for me. So now whenever I do have a flare up, I'm not afraid to reach out because I know that you have ideas and suggestions and you know, you always kind of reassure me that if this doesn't work, we can try something else, which is really different from a lot of, of my experience with previous dermatologists where I didn't always have the access to follow up or it would take forever to get in. And by that time things would be different and, um, there just was never any resolution or feeling like it was beneficial for me to call and make the appointment or go through the whole process. So I feel like my job is to support you, try to give you the tools you need to make your skin feel best. And in his, I mean, it's great. She's a, a veteran of this. You could, you could teach this course. You know, you know so much about yeah. it. How have you interacted, and, and an even bigger question is, how would you tell patients who are suffering or families who are suffering to, to interact best with their providers? Because you've had to navigate a lot of different personalities, including my craziness. How do you, what are tips and tricks to help get what you need and help them understand where you're at? Yeah, well, I think that I don't know what I would ever do if you retired, so please don't <laughs> do that. Um, I think finding someone that really works with you is really important, and I think that what really blew my mind the first time that I saw you was you gave me a, a new treatment plan and you said that this should work, like you should see something in four days. And if, if you don't, then email me or message me. And I thought that just the ability to reach out and say like, this isn't working, I need help, was so great without having to go through the obstacles of like trying to make the appointment and, you know, waiting for the phone call back or even just sending a message is so much easier than having to make the phone call and then making sure you're you've got your phone in your hand waiting for it to ring for the doctor to call you back you know so just being able to message you was so much easier for me and i'm, I'm guessing for you too because mm. making a phone call is isn't as easy as it sounds <laughs> so um, in terms of, of finding the other supports too, one of the things is you've gotten yeah. to come to some of our support groups. Yes. Do you feel like that's been helpful meeting other people with the, with the same condition? Absolutely. I actually wish that I would have had that in my younger years as well because I think that I've had a lot of like self-confidence and self-esteem issues that and have also felt like kind of a loner. Um, and the support group has been really great in just hearing what works for other people. Um, and just how different things work for different people and understanding like, you know, if you read something that you've Googled that works for everybody and then it doesn't work for you and then you're feeling even more in despair, whereas then you're at a support group and you're hearing all these different experiences and even, you know, getting other ideas and knowing that it might not work, but it, it may work and, you know, it's worth a try and just having um, a community that has a shared experience you know, so then you're feeling like validated in your struggle, I think is huge. Totally. Do you find, Rob, that your patients also feel incredibly isolated and yet you're going from room to room to room, seeing people with a very similar story, very similar setup, but they each feel isolated and alone? Right. No, for sure. And so any sort of support group, and again, the National Eggs Association is one for sort of virtual community that then can expand to actual communities with their expos and, and things that they do around the country from mm -hmm. time to time. I think those are huge because we've talked about what I will end up doing with my patients is I'll let them know that you know, you're going to be the expert in your eczema, not me, mm -hmm. and sort of go through the basic foundational principles like the critical aspect of moisturization, the fact that sometimes allergens are relevant and sometimes they're not, 
all of the sorts of triggers that are unique to them and then have them figure out the details of is bathing once a day best for me or just moisturizing that day but not bathing. Mm -hmm. And all of that is going to be uh, really critical because the individuality of the condition is, is just part and parcel of the definition of atopic dermatitis. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that also um, it's taken me a long time to get where I am right now. Like it, it's, it's really having to, to realize that you need to take the time to do it. And I think that now that I'm an adult, it makes more sense to me. But even in my younger years, I was like, why can't this just be easier, you know? And I think that getting through flare-ups are really tricky. Um, and that's what I needed to get through the flare-ups to get to a point of stability so that I could stay on top of it versus letting it get bad and then having to dig myself out of this deep hole, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That, yeah. You know, you kind of talked about your maintenance approach, and I think that's mm -hmm. in some ways the hardest. You have to be disciplined to do it, but yeah. boy, it, it seems like it pays off really yes. well. It just saves you from going down that vicious cycle where then you have to dig out, and it's right. really tough. Yeah, absolutely. What about if you, if you were going to advise uh, other patients, what are some of the tips you'd give them in terms of finding their best regimen? And maybe if you could give yourself advice um, yeah. at the end of your journey now. Yeah, I think that just really taking the time to realize that it's something that needs attention and isn't going to go away without being attended to um, is important. And really just making sure you, you're, you're doing that self-care because um, and, and it's really, it's a time thing. It sometimes is, you know, a financial thing because a lot of the lotions are expensive and the prescriptions need to be refilled every, you know, month. And it's being on top of it, having a reminder on your phone, making sure you don't run out and, you know, don't get into a place where you can't um, dig yourself out of. Now, one of the things my patients talk to me about a lot is the issue about food. And it's such a difficult issue and I always want to, I want to do better, I want to know more. What has your journey been like with avoiding foods? Because so many times you type in on the internet, yeah. it says just cut out a certain food and right. you're fine. We, yeah. we don't think that's the case for most people, of course, but right. what do you think? Um, I haven't had any success with like elimination diets. I do have food allergies where if I have certain things, I will have an anaphylactic reaction, so I absolutely avoid mm. those. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but besides that, I, I haven't had much success in just eliminating things like dairy or gluten, which are the big ones, but I have found that just eating a healthy diet and like limiting things that may cause inflammation um, has, has helped me in just maintaining um, my skin. As patients with atopic dermatitis do have more food allergies. The trick is, usually you can't just remove that food and all of a sudden their eczema is better. We talked about there being missing proteins in the skin that are the fundamental or one of the fundamental problems. Removing a food isn't gonna change the proteins in your skin necessarily. So I think what I will tell parents is not unlike what Katie sort of tried. I don't think just blind elimination diets are sensible. I think if there's not a piece that suggests anaphylaxis, if it's the history says, oh, I'm not sure, maybe it's related to food, maybe it's not, usually it's not, and then I feel safe saying, okay, do this. Don't change a thing you're eating for the next month. Don't change a thing you're doing other than all of these things we've talked about in terms of good skin care and moisturizing, et cetera, proper treatment, and then come back. And if they come back in a month and they haven't changed their diet, they haven't changed anything but their care of their skin, and they're a lot better, a lot of those allergy questions sort of drift to the side. I love that, and, and I agree. I, I think um, it's great that you tried it because many of my patients, they wanna try those things too, mm -hmm. and I, I encourage them to a certain extent. I, yeah. I, if it's as easy as avoiding food, by all means, you know that would be the best. Right. It's just for so many patients, they really seem to end up about where you do. Healthy diet's so important. I want mm -hmm. you eating well, putting good stuff in, and avoiding the foods you're obviously allergic to, by, mm -hmm. by all means, you have to, but then being, you know, trying to find foods that are triggering it or driving it, usually it's, it's not the best use of time or energy, especially while they're suffering. It's like, well, if you have a if you have a fire in your kitchen, mm -hmm. right now we need to put out the fire. We don't want to think about why mm -hmm. it happened. We're going to do that. We just, let's just get things yep. cool, and then we can sort of explore that. A lot of my patients, particularly the moderate and severe patients, will also see an allergist because they can be an important part of their care. Have you seen an allergist before, or is that part of your experience? Yes, absolutely. As a as a child, I had um, years of allergy shots, but more recently, I had seen an allergist an allergist and had a blood test done, which was different than the typical uh, 
patch test that they've done and the blood test showed numbers that were through the roof and the allergist was surprised at the fact that I was sitting there and not currently having an anaphylactic reaction. Um, so it was interesting trying to figure out what was a true allergy versus what was just because I was a flare up. Anything else you would want to share with other patients or providers? Because again, not, not everyone gets a patient who's as sophisticated and as experienced as you to be able to tell us. What else would you want us to know? Yeah, well, I think um, for me, one of the big things is sometimes the co-occurring um, issues. And, and like for me, the alopecia was a big one, which I didn't realize was connected and was kind of a relief for me once I realized like, oh, they kind of go together and it's not alarming that my hair is falling out and huge lumps on the floor mm. um, and I think that the other big thing for me was just the communication between the provider and and the patient has been really beneficial and a game changer so those are the two things that I think were big for me fantastic thank you so much for coming yeah. and sharing all this with us and we wish you all the best and I look thank forward you. to seeing you back yeah. and, and uh, we'll be in close touch for sure great thank you so much thank you Nice to meet you. Nice to meet and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sidbury, for coming to as well today. Uh, we're so glad to have had you in a wonderful discussion. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. We hope you found this interesting and useful for your practice, and we appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash JYX860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.